Hi, my name is Susan Emery. I am with the Suffolk Theatre Arts Department, and today we will be sitting down with Stephen Lance Geffro to talk about our upcoming production, Five Women Wearing the Same Dress. I think we needed a comedy, in fact, two comedies to uh, start the semester. So the second show this semester will be Young Frankenstein, um, the musical. Um, for this one, I wanted something that uh, when I do comedies, I like there to be a dark underbelly to these comedies. The audiences will, uh, will get the jokes, they'll laugh at the situations, but there's something dark that's driving this entire play. And throughout the play, we gradually discover what that is. There are, I, I can't say two or three protagonists in this show, although there are. We never see the antagonists. Uh, Tracy the Bride it has just gotten married. And uh, she wasn't able to, she doesn't have really any friends. A very popular woman, very outgoing, very, this is an upper class Knoxville family. Uh, so these five bridesmaids, it makes no sense that these are the five she chose because none of them are friends with her, which is one of the sad things, you know, about the play. Uh, the other antagonist that we run into is Tommy Valentine, and he's talked a lot. He's talked about a lot. Everybody's had an experience one way or the other with him. So uh, the day of the wedding, the ceremony's just taken place, and one by one, all the bridesmaids come into Meredith's room. Meredith is the sister of the bride. And uh, they, uh, they, they need to escape the wedding. They don't like the bride. They don't like, they, they don't like the situation that they're in. Um, so they spend most of the time in that room, smoking pot and drinking. It's challenging as always. We have a shorter period of time this time than, I, uh, than I've had in the past on things. Um, but I also have a very talented cast. They are uh, young, however, and as are well, most of the plays that we do here at Suffolk, the older characters, um, we have to uh, work with the younger actors to immerse them in those characterizations so that they don't come off as 18-year-olds when they're playing 32-year-olds. It's easier for some of the younger cast members because uh, the 22-year-olds, 21-year-olds, even the 25-year-old born-again Christian is closer you know, to their actual ages. But for at least half the cast, they go a little bit older. So they've had to do their research into uh, actors um, that are out there from film, from uh, television, from plays that they can get a hold of so that they can immerse themselves in the research some of our kids, you know, as, as you know, some of our kids have led pretty difficult lives. And that is one of the keys. Once you tap into that and they're comfortable working within that framework and tapping into those things that have hurt them in their lives, but doing it in a very healthy, constructive way, then the age naturally comes and suddenly the ensemble starts to form. Friendships, bonds, which are necessary to drive this play. Alan Ball um, wrote um, American Beauty. He also wrote Six Feet Under. His women are strong women, and these are strong women in this cast. So the thing about it is, you have to find that individual strength within each one and what drives them either towards Tracy if they feel too guilty about hanging out up there, or, or what keeps them in the room because they, they can't stand her. So again, it's that research into, in their real lives, who they have an antagonistic relationship with or a protagonistic relationship with. We do nightly uh, vocal exercises and they have to do those exercises, all of them, in, uh, in their dialects. It's Knoxville, Tennessee. From here until the show closes, whenever they're at school, whenever they're addressing anybody, it has to be in those dialects. I've given them, they don't have to do it in class. I've, you know, I'm, I'm not totally heartless. <laughs> But uh, when they're in the halls talking to people, when they're just, just, when they're talking to their friends on the phone, the dialect has to be there so that they can totally immerse themselves in that. Andy's done a beautiful job on these costumes, man. And on, uh, on the hairstyle, the hats, uh, everything with that. I've got uh, Locke designed the set, Locke and Loud. I got a great set for this. Jason is uh, doing the lights on this, but he's also mentoring um, Cassidy. Uh, who is going to be doing, I think, most of the lighting work. And Jason is a great mentor for that. Steve Green has been building the sets. He's also my sound designer. So uh, there's Iron Maiden, uh, there's Bob Marley, and then the cast had to, um, the cast had to send in a list of their top 
five or ten songs from that era. So they had to do a little research into that. And then Stephen Green takes that, and that's our pre-show music as well as our intermission music, so that they have ownership of the play in more than one way. We have people in the crew that uh, just wanted to work on sets. So they, uh, they came in and they uh, signed up and, and they volunteered for it. We get, uh, we get strong majors in this, uh, in this department, but we also get the people who come in who just want to build sets. And it's, it's great having that kind of energy on this campus, especially now when we're coming back from the pandemic. What I want the audience to take away from this is that uh, these five women They've had a past with each other at one point or another, most of them. But they find out that despite their differences throughout this play, that they actually have, unfortunately, more in common than they thought they actually did. So there's this bond that forms during the show between these women.